welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 171, featuring the second part of my interview with Mr. Josh Sawyer. Now, in this part of the interview, we focus in on Josh's early days in the, in the industry, his uh, work on the Icewind Dale and Neverwinter Nights series, as well as some projects that got canceled, such as Project Jefferson and the Aliens RPG. A lot of great stuff, so without further ado, here is Mr. Josh Sawyer. All right, Josh, you said uh, in some other interviews that the most the games that have inspired you the most or had the most influence on you are Darklands, uh, Fallout, and uh, Pool of Radiance. And I assume this is the, the, the good, the the good Pool of Radiance. Right. Uh, so what was it about those these games that sucked you in? Uh, well, Pool of Radiance, um, I like the ability to have my full, my full party. Uh, I could make a party of all sorts of different characters. Um, I liked the sense of exploration and flan. I thought that was actually really, it's sort of crazy when you look at, when you look at the map from the adventurer's journal, because it's like, here's the slums and kudos well and Mendor's library and all that stuff. Um, but it was, it was cool to be able to go into an area and kind of, um, kind of figure out where I could go. And so when you stumble into Mendor's library and suddenly you, you're fighting a basilisk or a specter, you just came out of the slums. That was, <laughs> that was a big deal. And so that sense of exploration was really cool. Um, I liked that it had a very Forgotten Realms feel in the sense that a library has a basilisk and a specter in it. Like there, there are these really weird locations on like, uh, the Sorcerer's Pyramid was another really like just interesting, weird location. Uh, it just had a lot of neat stuff in it. And, and so I liked that about Full of Radiance and the big battles, the big tactical battles I thought were really fun. Sokol Keep was really cool. Um, Valhinging Graveyard was really crazy. Um, really crazy. And then, uh, Darklands, uh, great exploration. Uh, I I really love history, so I love I love the idea of having a historically based game that that tried to be extremely accurate and down to earth with everything. And I think that if that was an afterthought, I wouldn't like it nearly as much. But the fact that it is so consistent and how it approaches the historical content really made me love it. Uh, it was the first real time of pause combat system that I can remember, so I really enjoyed that. Uh, and I thought they had an interesting approach to magic. The way that they use saints and alchemy was really awesome. And uh, and then uh, Fallout. Fallout was really, to me, the first game I had played where I felt like choice and consequence in the sense of being able to be the, the type of character personality-wise that I wanted to be was uh, really supported. So I could be a really horrible... I mean, I could kill everyone. and um, Or I could kill nobody. I, I could be very... I had a lot of agency, and so uh, Fallout, I think, to me, was the, the beginning of where I really started to think, like, yeah, it's it's really cool in a game when it doesn't just allow you what sort of character to be from the perspective of, mechanically, what character do I want to be, but who do I want to be as a person, and and the game responds to it. It's not just that I can make a choice and it gets thrown into the ether and it disappears. It's that I make a choice, and people care about it, and some of those choices are short -term, have short-term impacts, and other ones have long-term impacts. And the way that those choices sort of interleave makes it my story, not just the designer's story. Well, Josh, let's talk about your your origins in the in the industry. I saw a funny quotation from an earlier interview where you described yourself as a lazy wastrel. You know, back in the day, I guess in college, a lazy wastrel who plays video games and tabletop yep. RPGs all day. But then I guess you had this epiphany, and you taught yourself Flash, and then. <laughs> send your resume off to Interplay. Uh, that's one of the more interesting origin stories. You know, how did is that uh, is that an accurate? Yeah, assessment? Um, I mean, I played. I've been playing <clears throat> tabletop D and D since the early '80s. I guess I started with the Red Box, um, and Bard's Tale was my first CRPG. Which I, I can't remember which game. I think Bard's Tale actually came before the tabletop stuff. But Bard's Tale won in the Commodore 64, um, and then. Uh, a lot of D&D, &D. and then when I went into college, uh, I mean, I played a lot of D&D &D in high school and a few other role-playing games, but in college, I really played a ton of tabletop games, and I continued playing uh, video games, and uh, I really was not a good student. <laughs> I originally went to school for uh, music, and then uh, I uh, switched over to the college and became a history student. And actually, I wound up studying the history of, of witch hunting in uh, the Holy Roman Empire. So there's a lot of dark lines overlap there. And uh, yeah, I taught myself web design. I don't know what it was. I mean, I had always been interested in graphic design, I guess. 
And so I taught myself web design and eventually I taught myself flash to do a tattooing a website for a tattoo parlor. And then a, a friend of mine in college, uh, he told me that Interplay was hiring a webmaster and I really, I was about to graduate and honestly I, I had a really bad, really bad uh, grade point average and I did not know what I was going to do with my history degree and, and theater minor. So <laughs> not that that would have helped very much. You could always fall back on the theater if the history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. I figured I would just be a web, a web developer in Wisconsin, but I saw this opportunity and because I played so much D&D and I knew that that Black Isle was sort of involved in, in D&D stuff, uh, I sent this crazy, I think it was like a three or four page cover letter. It's, it's ridiculous. Like, I, I'm glad I don't have it anymore because I think I'd probably be embarrassed if I read it, but I just went off like about everything I wanted to see in the future of role playing games and D&D games and stuff like that. And I got an interview and I flew out there and um, I was actually, there were, uh, I was not the first choice. There was another choice who uh, he was more qualified than me and he was going to take the job, a job. He was going to take the job, but then his girlfriend was moving to Oregon. So he decided to move with her. So wherever you are guy, thank you. Um, so I got hired there and I was the, I was the web designer for Planescape Torment. And then eventually I redesigned the Baldur's Gate site. I designed the Icewind Dale site and then the original Neverwinter Nights site. Uh, but then after that, I transferred over into development full time as a junior designer on Icewind Dale. Yeah, I was wondering about that transition. It sounds like you were having a lot of fun doing the, the websites, but I guess you also had a lot of regular interaction with the rest of the, of the team, right? Yeah, I... Um, I was over, we were in two buildings in Interplay there, and so I was with the web team uh, in the building that the executive row was in, and Black Isle was over in the, the more development-centric building. So I would run across the street, run upstairs, and go and talk to Tim Donnelly from uh, the Torment team, or Avalon, or Comic Con, or whomever, and uh, I would just kind of ask them questions and kind of harass them and bother them. <laughs> and I would bother Fergus, and I think at a certain point, uh, a few of them sort of realized that I, I knew a lot about D&D and I like really a lot about D&D and they wanted to make a Forgotten Realms game and I knew a ton about the Forgotten Realms. So uh, there was just an opening for a junior design position. It started out first time, but uh, I, I didn't really know what I was doing in terms of uh, the editor side of things or even in some ways common sense uh, a lot of times escaped me. But, <laughs> but I put a lot of time and effort into it and I eventually got to a place where I was like, okay, I, I kind of know what I'm doing now and, and uh, then I switched over full time. Was your, your first project uh, something called Project Jefferson, uh, which apparently was going to be a third Baldur's Gate game? I mean, what would I, what would I, what I wouldn't give to see that? I mean, what, what can you tell me about that project? Well, so that actually wasn't my first project. My first project oh, okay. was original Icewind Dale. Um, so I worked on Icewind Dale, and then I worked on Heart of Winter, which is the expansion. And around that time, I had talked to Fergus about. I had said we should do, we should do a Forgotten Realms game using our own our own technology, and we should uh, try to make it 3D, but we should use pre-rendered um, shadows and light maps so that it has it really has like the cool lighting, because this was really still pretty early in 3D, and so when we looked at Neverwinter Nights, Neverwinter Nights had a ton of modularity. You could swap pieces out in real time, do all this awesome stuff, but it was all dynamic lighting, and at that time, dynamic lighting was not great. So we, you know, I said, why don't we make our own tech? <clears throat> we can make this awesome editor. We can make all this stuff, and that way we don't have to be relying, reliant on someone else's technology. And uh, yeah, it was it was actually not initially conceived of as being a Baldur's Gate title. <clears throat> it was a uh, it was a title that was set in the Dale Lands, part of the Forgotten Realms, and it was a third edition game. <clears throat> and what eventually happened, though, is that due to various legal complications. Interplay lost the right to, basically they only retained the right to make, as far as I, I know, Icewind Dale games, Baldur's Gate games, and maybe Dark Alliance games. So because of that, it was like, well, is this game we're making closer to Baldur's Gate or Icewind Dale? And we're like, well, I mean, I guess it's closer to Baldur's Gate. So then it became it became labeled as uh, Baldur's Gate 3, but it, it really didn't have anything to do with the, the plot line of the first two games. <clears throat> So what did you do on Icewind Dale 1? Uh, what I did on Icewind Dale 1 was primarily area design and a lot of item and spell design. <clears throat> so I worked on Dragon's Eye, 
that was probably my first area, which probably shows because it's not that good. Um, I worked on Dragon's Eye. I worked on Lower Dorn's Deep. I worked on, I think, a few levels of Cresselax Tomb with John Diley. Uh, I helped work with Steve Bacchus on the final battle with Bellyfet. And I wrote a variety of characters, uh, nothing really major. And then a lot of the rest of the, of the stuff that I did was um, new rule system stuff. So I helped design and implement the racial abilities because th those actually weren't in Baldur's Gate. Those came with Icewind Dale. So we implemented all the racial abilities for characters, uh, all the new spells. We expanded the Druid spell selection stuff for Heart of Winter uh, later on. And I wrote... I think about 80 descriptions for unique items in Icewind Dale. That was something that I really enjoyed doing. I was really a fan of the old Forgotten Realm supplements like the Magister, where you open them up and they, they have stats for weapons, but it, like the stats for the weapons are kind of like, yeah, yeah, it's at the end. Then the beginning of it is the cool story about you know where this weapon came from and what adventurers used it and how they died and then this other guy took it and it got lost. So um, I had a lot of fun writing that stuff up, and uh, but yeah, it was just it was a mixture of stuff. I, I mostly did area design, item design, and, and spell design. Well, is it true that Icewind Dale Two was your first project as as a lead? Well, technically, uh, Jefferson was my first project as a lead, but Icewind okay. was the first project that I had uh, where uh, I it shipped and I was the lead. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, Icewind Dale Two, one of my favorite games. And I, I'm curious about the development of this game as, as well as just in general your thoughts on uh, the party-based games uh, versus a single-character game. Uh, so Icewind Dale 2 was kind of an emergency for us. Um, it, uh, it Basically, Torn was canceled. Torn was a project that Black Isle had been working on for a while, and Interplay, for a variety of reasons, was not in great shape, and, and Torn had some, some problems, unfortunately because uh, there was a lot of cool stuff in it, but it, it was it was canceled. And so we had a lot of people in the studio, and it was also the first time, I think, ever that anyone in Black Isle had been laid off. We had had no layoffs prior to Torn being canceled. And even though it was only four or five people, it was four or five people that a lot of us have been working with for a long time. So we kind of went into an emergency mode where we needed to make uh, a solid game in a reasonable amount of time that we knew we could get done without a lot of complications. Uh, the original the original timeline for Icewind Dale 2 uh, was actually only four months. <laughs> um, so uh, it was the timeline to make it was was about four months, and uh, I had about I think I had like two days to write the story for it. So um, write the story, lay out the major characters, and and what all the areas would be. I didn't have to fully design the areas, but I had to block out like. You know, we're going to have an ice ice temple. We're going to have this. We're going to have this forest area. We're going to have the Black Raven Monastery. We're going to have this. And I gave a very high level overview of what those things were going to be. But then it was like a sprint. Like we had all these designers who had a ton of experience working on Torment and Icewind Dale One and Heart of Winter and Trials of Lure Master. And I was just like, guys, here is a high level design. You know how to make these games go. And uh, it was a struggle. And Area design can't be compressed that much. Even with the amount, number of designers we had on that team, we couldn't compress area design enough to get it out in four months. And we were pretty aware of that, um, but that's what was kind of desired. So we pushed for it. When it became obvious that we there was no way that we were going to do that, we sort of reevaluated what we were doing. We decided it made sense to uh, make it a third edition game as much as we could. And the major things that we left out were uh, things like metamagic feats and attacks of opportunity. There were a few other things that were oversights, but we actually converted a surprising amount of the engine over to third edition rules and added in a lot of the optional Forgotten Realms uh, sub races and things like that. And uh, yeah, in, in total, it was a 10 month development cycle and uh, it was a really big game. Uh, Ferguson, I was very concerned that it was going to be too short because part of winter wound up being very short. But that was not a short game. Uh, it probably would have benefited from being a little bit shorter. There's a lot of content in there that was really extremely dense with combat. Um, it wasn't very polished. So I think a lot of us regret that you know, we we didn't have time to kind of like polish that stuff up. But it was done in ten months, and I think people had a pretty pretty good amount of, of fun with it. So it was a it was a nice send off for the Infinity Engine. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. A very fun game. I'm surprised. You know, I didn't realize I had this sort of turgid uh, development history. But uh, what about Gauntlet Seven Sorrows? 
as my understanding, you worked uh, on that for a while with uh, John Romero, who's one of my early earlier interviews, Midway's uh, San Diego studio. Now, something didn't work out with this project. I mean, what, what was going on? Um, I think I'll just say it didn't work out. My my idea of what my idea of the level of what needed to be done with that game didn't really match what Midway wanted to do with it. And I understood that they needed to do what they needed to do, but I said, I don't, I don't want to be here to do that. So I left. I get the feeling they'd have been better off going uh, with your view. <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's hard. It's, it's one of those things where I, I like being a designer because I don't have to deal with, um, I don't really want to run a company. And the more I, more I sort of see, either at a very high level, like at a company the size of Midway, or even, you know, like the stuff that the owners of Obsidian have to deal with, like, I'm sure that, you know, there's a certain satisfaction that comes with running a company very well, but the, I, I am fine with the pressure of running a team. And so, again, when I sort of looked at Midway, like, what they were doing in a, to a certain extent made financial sense, but I said, well, but I'm, I'm a designer, and I, I want to design things. I don't want to just make things for the sake of making them or make things for the sake of making money. So I said, it's, it's fine that you want to do that and make this game, but I don't, I don't want to do it that way. And so I decided to leave. So. Well, after Black Isle uh, Studios was shut down, uh, you moved to Obsidian Entertainment, right? So I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about this Black transition. Isle Mid- it was Black Isle to Midway and then, and then to Obsidian. Okay, Black- <laughs> okay, so after Black Isle shut down, you went to Midway, which we just talked about, and then to Obsidian. Uh, so can you tell me a little bit about what Obsidian was like at this time? It was uh, it was interesting because they had already done um, they had already done uh, Nice of the Old Republic two and that was a big crunch for those guys and they had launched right into making Neverwinter Nights two and there was a pretty big team there I mean I I think maybe I had come up once before and seen the team when it was it was very small when it was initially working on Kotor two and uh, it was way bigger on. Um, when they were working on number one or two, but it was, uh, it was kind of frantic <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of, there are a lot of questions. I mean, we were, they were redoing the renderer and there were a lot, there was still a lot of development going on of core content, but uh, it was a lot of people that I'd seen at Black Isle. So I knew all those guys. And then there were a number of other people from even earlier at Interplay, like uh, T Ray Tramel, uh, Isaac who had also come there. And, and so it was a, it was a pretty interesting group of guys that were working there at the time. So what was the first project you worked on at Obsidian? I worked on Neverwinter 2 initially. Um, for a while, when I was on the project, I wasn't sure if I was necessarily a great fit uh, for the team. And so I worked on another project for a while that eventually was canceled. And then eventually I came back over to Never- Neverwinter 2 um, after uh, Ferret, who was the lead designer, had left Neverwinter 2. Uh, I went back over to Neverwinter 2 to, um, for the last six months to sort of wrap it up. So most of my responsibilities in Neverwinter 2 were not so much content creation, although I did a, a little bit of that, but it was mostly uh, very high-level uh, design stuff, like sort of determining how do we revise this to make this work, what features do we really want to get in, how should this design really be approached. So it was, it was a lot of um, kind of troubleshooting and firefighting and, and, and doing a triage on, on what was there. Now that project that got canceled, was that the Aliens RPG? Well, that was another project that got canceled even later. <laughs> oh, okay. I got my cancellations mixed up here. Yep. <laughs> so what was the one that got canceled for uh, Obsidian? What's that? Uh, what project was got canceled from Obsidian? I don't think we ever said what that was or, or if we can't actually say it anymore, so sorry. <laughs> wow, well, that's extremely canceled. Yeah. <laughs> what about the Aliens one then? Um, the Aliens project came later. That was uh, working with Sega. Uh, I thought that would be a really, I thought that was actually a really good fit. A lot of people didn't understand why we would want to make a, uh, or or how we could make a role-playing game in the Aliens universe. I thought it was actually a great fit. I think that the Aliens films, even though people think of them as being about the aliens, I think they're actually more about the humans and, and the androids and how they interact and how they screw each other over or bond or, you know, basically sacrifice to keep each other alive. And so it seemed like a great fit uh, for the sort of role-playing game that Black Isle had made and that Obsidian had made. So uh, that went on for a while. And yeah, for various reasons, that wound up uh, being canceled. 
Uh, it was a lot of fun working on it. Um, but yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that one. I, I really wish that hadn't been canceled because it really sounds fascinating to me as well. You know, this this I love the aliens universe. Uh, but what about Baldur's Gate uh, Dark Alliance? Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance was something I don't actually know who came up with the the idea for doing it, but I think the idea was um, Interplay wanted to do more console development because we had been a very strictly PC house for a long time, or maybe that's not really accurate, but a really heavy emphasis on, on PC uh, stuff. And especially with role-playing games, it was, it was very much PC-focused. Uh, in Black Isle, we, we sort of recognized that the games that we made were very focused on, on the PC. It would probably not be such a great fit for the console. And uh, with Snowblind, you know, Black Isle published it. I think Avalon did a decent amount of work on it. I did a little bit of work on some of the, it wasn't a ton of work. It was like spells, spell design and some UI design, but really it was just to say, you know, um, take the sort of spirit of kind of a single player D and D game and make it into something that's more console friendly. So it's not, it's not really deep, but it tries to capture the spirit of a lot of the, uh, the things that you find in it, not even the mechanics, but like, you know, if you play a barbarian or if you play this sort of a character, it kind of gives that feel of, of being that sort of a character in the D&D game, not mechanically, but just sort of the idea of being that character. And it was really more, um, you know, more kind of a hack and slash and loot game. Uh, in Dark Alliance 2, I actually thought that the team did a really great job. Uh, Dave Maldonado and the other designers, I think they made a lot of awesome uh actually like really interesting characters in, in those games and made a lot of cool mechanical additions, but they were pretty neat because that was my, that was my first real exposure to console uh, gaming at all. Um, it wasn't until midway that I actually was fully, you know, involved in console development. So Dark Alliance was a cool introduction. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with part three of my interview with Mr. Josh Sawyer. A lot of great stuff coming up, including his time at Obsidian and his work on the Fallout games. A lot of great stuff coming up, coming up so uh, stay tuned for that. Um, also, the Kickstarter projects I talked about last time, Hero U and uh, uh, the Shadowgate game, uh, those projects are about halfway done now, and they're, they've still got a long ways to go on there before they'll make their goals. So I'm going to post uh, in the show notes links to that, also uh, a link to Sandy Peterson's Call of Cthulhu uh, game for you. Uh, so if you want to support those projects, the time to do it is now. I'd really hate to see any of those projects not make their goals. So uh, please, if you like uh, Sandy and Lori and Corey as, and Dave, uh, go support their Kickstarter projects. I'm, I'm sure they'll really appreciate that and it'll help us get some really cool new games. Now, also, don't forget to support this show if you want to see more interviews with your favorite designers and retrospectives of your uh, favorite computer games, uh, then go to armchairarcade.com, look for the Matt Chat link in the top right corner. Donations of any size are appreciated and they're very much needed and necessary to keep these episodes coming, so thank you very much, guys. Now, what about that Ale of the Week? Uh, this week I have a little selection here called the Chain Breaker White IPA. Uh, this is brewed by the Deschutes Brewery in Bend, Oregon. A uh, pretty interesting uh, slogan they've got here. The trail to tasty is never safe and gentle, but where's the fun in middle of the road? Sentiment I hardly agree with. Not seeing a lot of information here on the bottle. Apparently they want me to uh, pour two-thirds in a tilted glass, swirl what's left around the bottle, resume pouring. Yeah, I think I'll just use my trusty drinking horn. I do not see... Oh, there it is. 5.6% alcohol, so I shouldn't be bad at all. Uh, so let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this chain breaker here in the old drinking horn. Ah, smells good. Kind of a... Citrusy lemon, almost a bit of orange scent in there. Really nice, really fragrant. My hopes are up for this. Let's give it a taste. Quite pleasant, a little bitterness, a little hoppiness. I guess that's the IEPA part of that. That's uh, followed uh, by that, uh, a very citrusy uh, aftertaste on this. 
It's not bad at all. Uh, definitely some some sophistication, I guess, uh, with the flavors. You kind of get sort of a lemon pine uh, kind of aftertaste in there. It's uh, maybe a little on the bitter side if you don't like uh, bitterness and hoppiness, but uh, I actually uh, quite like this one. You know, it's a... Uh, it's kind of tough to uh, make a really uh, good call on this one, but I think I'm gonna go maybe with uh, three out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, uh, quite nice, uh, probably not my favorite IPA ever, uh, but it's interesting and uh, definitely worth uh, checking out. So, uh, Chain Breaker White IPA. Uh, now, what about the quotation? Uh, the quotation from this week comes from one of my favorite philosophers of all time, Plato, and it goes something like this. You can learn more about a man in an hour of play than a whole year of conversation. See you guys next week. How could anything grow in that place? It smells of death. Death and power are close cousins. Don't think I like your relatives, old man.